In this video, we'll introduce good quantum numbers, or what I mean by the phrase good quantum numbers. In the last video, we ended by talking about spin-orbit interaction, and how one result of spin-orbit interaction is that angular momentum and spin are no longer good quantum numbers. And so now let's talk about what in the heck I mean by that in the first place. So let's start by summarizing a little bit the quantum numbers that we've talked about. So we have we have n, which is the principal quantum number. We have l, which is the orbital angular momentum. Quantum number. We have m sub l, which is the orbital magnetic quantum number. And we have s which is the spin, and then we have m sub s, which is the spin magnetic quantum number. In each and every one of these quantum numbers, actually what they correspond to are operators that commute with the Hamiltonian. So the n comes from the actual eigenvalues themselves. And so this is the semi-trivial statement that h commutes with itself. The L's come from the commutation of H with L squared. The M sub L's come from the commutation of H with LZ. The S comes from the fact that S squared commutes with the Hamiltonian. And finally, M sub S comes from the commutation of h with sz. Okay, so in each of these cases, it just so happened that the eigenvalues associated with these operators, with l squared, lz, s squared, and sz, could be indexed with integers, or in these cases, with half integers. And so that gave us a simple way to write out the different eigenvalues for that correspond to these different operators. But really what these mean, what these statements imply, are conservation properties. So what that means is that if we have any wave function, psi of t, any wave function at all, and then we look at the expectation value of any of these properties, over time, then what you can prove rigorously is that this will always be just some fixed value that does not depend on time. Another way to put it is that the expectation value of any of these properties that commute, if you look at those derivative of this expectation value with respect to time, this will be zero. Right, and so it does not matter whatsoever what psi is, it will be true for any wave function whatsoever as long as what you're looking at are one of these operators that commutes with the Hamiltonian. And that's why this is really special to look at, right? So no matter what, no matter what insane way you come up with to prepare a wave function, these quantum numbers tell you something about the conservation properties of the system based on the Hamiltonian, not on the actual initial state of the system. Okay, so this is related to, so, so this is a way of saying that the total angular momentum is conserved because you have a central potential. Or similarly, that the projection of the angular momentum onto the z-axis is preserved, or it doesn't change over time. The spin, the total value of the spin is preserved, meaning it can't change over time. So all of these things, you know, same thing. So the, the projection of sz, or the projection of s onto z, doesn't change over time, just because each of these things commutes with the Hamiltonian. So this tells us a lot about the, uh, the expected behavior of, of these systems just by looking at these commutators. And so whenever, whenever a quantum number corresponds to an operator that is conserved by the Hamiltonian, it is referred to as a good quantum number. And so that means each of these can be considered good if we're dealing with the purely electric Hamiltonian.
But remember that with spin orbit, Now the full Hamiltonian is a spin orbit Hamiltonian, which takes this additional form. So we have this we have the H naught, which is the original Hamiltonian, plus this XC of R, which is a radial dependent term that we don't worry about the details for, and then plus this L dot S term. And the consequence of this L dot S term is that now the Hamiltonian, the full spin orbit Hamiltonian, no longer commutes with LZ or SZ, which means that under the spin orbit interaction, M sub S and M sub L are no longer good quantum numbers. So on its face, it looks like we lose two whole quantum numbers because now that spin orbit is turn, turned on, m sub l and m sub s are not conserved. Okay, but it turns out there's a different quantity that is conserved, and that's the one that we need to pay attention to, and that corresponds to the total angular momentum. So we define the total angular momentum as j, so j hat is equal to l hat plus s hat, and this is the same definition for every component of j hat, l hat, or s hat. So for example, we have that jz is equal to lz plus sz, or also that j hat squared is equal to l plus s squared. And if you expand this out, you see that this will turn into l squared plus s squared plus 2 times l dot s, where these are the vector parts again. And you notice that this is the same L dot S that you see up here. And so this is how we can start to guess that this, uh, this up here will actually commute with J squared. And it turns out that this will commute with JZ, so the total angular momentum. So what that means is that HSO will commute with J hat squared. And it will also commute with JZ. And so now what are the quantum numbers that are associated with j? Well, to know that, we need to know what, what the eigenvalues of j squared and jz are. And fortunately, because this is an angular momentum, it behaves just like every other angular momentum that we've talked about. And so we know immediately what this is going to look like. So we'll define this in Brockhead notation, where we have states that are labeled by j and m sub j and j will be the quantum number that corresponds to j squared, and m sub j will be the quantum number that corresponds to jz. And so just like every other case that we've seen of this, we'll then have that j squared applied to j m sub j is equal to h bar squared j times j plus 1 times the original ket. And similarly, we have jz applied to j m sub j is equal to h bar m sub j times the original ket. Okay, and now this j here is another good quantum number because j squared commutes with the spin orbit Hamiltonian. And now this m sub j is a good quantum number because jz will commute with the spin orbit Hamiltonian. Okay, so let's wrap up by summarizing everything that we've learned about the quantum numbers that we've dealt with so far. Okay, so we've listed these here. The major quantum numbers that we've talked about are L and M sub L, S and M sub S, and then J and M sub J. Now let's start from the top. Now the operator that corresponds to the quantum number L is the operator L squared. And this has eigenvalues of H bar squared L times L plus one. 
and this remains a good quantum number even in the presence of spin orbit. The next quantum number we have is m sub l, and the operator that corresponds to this is lz, and these eigenvalues are h bar times m sub l. But the m sub l quantum number is only good when lz commutes with a Hamiltonian, which will only be true without spin orbit. Next we have the s quantum number. The operator that corresponds to the s quantum number is the operator s squared, which takes eigenvalues h bar squared s times s plus 1. And this is also still a good quantum number, even in the presence of spin orbit. Next we have the m sub s quantum number, and the operator that corresponds to this is s z which takes eigenvalues h bar times m sub s. But just like m sub l, this is only going to be a good quantum number when we don't have the spin orbit interaction in the Hamiltonian. And then finally, we have our two new quantum numbers. So first is the quantum number j, which corresponds to the operator j squared. And j squared has eigenvalues h bar squared j times j plus 1. And this is always a good quantum number. Because this is the total angular momentum, and that this is, this is the complete statement that the laws of physics are invariant to rotation. Now finally, let's take a look at our last new quantum number, which is the m sub j quantum number. This corresponds to the operator jz, which takes eigenvalues h bar times mj, and this will also always be a good quantum number. And so just to recap, what this means is that for all of these operators where we've said that they are good quantum numbers, it means that these will be conserved properties, so without any external perturbation, you will never have a particle spontaneously change its value of j, m sub j, s, or l. But it also means that, that due to spin orbit interaction, the solutions of the time independent Schrodinger equation for hydrogen will not have definite values of lz. So if you apply lz, you won't get back a single eigenvalue times the original function. You'll get something more complicated. And same for sz. But you will get conservation for jz. OK, so this tells us that j leads to good quantum numbers. But it doesn't tell us yet what values of j to expect. And so in the next video, we will introduce how to add angular momentum so that we can deduce what values of j are allowed when we combine specific values of l and s.